right, hello and welcome to another expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Robert Pizzini, who is in lovely Virginia Beach in Virginia. How are you doing, Robert? I'm doing great. How are you? Excellent. And I'm here in lovely San Diego, as usual. So, Robert, you are uh, retired from the U.S. Navy after 26 years of service, and you built a number of multi-million dollar businesses, including the indoor skydiving, which is something I've never done, but it sounds exciting. Um, and, uh, and now you also uh, coach and mentor people on leadership and the combination of military and corporate leadership and how you bring those uh, principles together to be really successful. So when you, when you first uh, left the Navy and you started your first businesses, how much of a transition was it from leadership within a military con context into mil uh, leadership within a civilian business concept, uh, concept? Sure, sure. Well, first, let me say that uh, there is an iFly San Diego uh, not too yeah. far from you. That's Mission true. Valley. So uh, yeah. they'd be happy to see you. And um, yeah, they would. It, it's it's more about me getting uh, you know get, getting up the courage to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead and do it. Uh, you know, uh, bad knee, bad back, none of that matters. You're floating on a cushion of air. Just go have fun. <laughs> um, but uh, there is a transition going from military leadership to civilian leadership. There's no question about that. And the military leadership model, things are very rigid. Things are very cut and dry. Um, there's, you know, of the various styles of leadership, directive is one that's a little more appropriate in the military. Uh, it could also apply with police, fire, EMS, you know, mm -hmm. first responder situations where danger uh, to life or property is on the line. Um, and, and that's really the nature of the military. Transitioning into the private sector, uh, that's not the case so much. And I certainly had to go through a transition process where I had to uh, adjust my leadership to several different factors in the civilian, in, in, I say civilian, in the private sector environment. Mm -hmm. One is uh, working with younger people, millennials, people who um, haven't had this kind of intensity of training that, that their peer group, the same age people in the military have had. Sure. So you have to uh, be aware of that and, and recognize the background of each individual as you apply your principles of leadership. Then on top of that, uh, I would say there's a lot of similarity as well in terms of having a clearly defined mission, mitigating risk. And uh, the other big difference then is in, in the private sector, ROI, return on investment, is the mission. And mm -hmm. in the military, you know, the mission has various different uh, uh, outcomes. Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, so therefore, it must be it must be a very. Uh, I mean, one of the challenges I think that everybody faces in leadership, and particularly today, and you touched on it um, when you mentioned millennials, is that in leadership today, you it's probably the most multi generational workforce that's ever been. Uh, I think there's statistics that uh, that back that up. Um, and you have very different types of people at every, and, and even within those generations, you have very different types of people. So it's a challenge for leadership and how to lead so many kind of diverse people with different needs and, uh, and, and ways that they react to. Yeah, for sure. That gets into, you know, something that's very uh, prevalent in the workplace today, which is diversity and inclusion. <laughs> Yeah. And, um, you know, I had to look serious uh, at that within my the company that I, op that I operate now. I have 41 employees. I have people of different age groups, as you indicated. I have people from different parts of the United States. I have people of different uh, disabled status. I have veteran status. I have uh, obviously there's race, color, creed, religion, et cetera. And don't mind that phone ringing in the background. That there. is fine. But um, so, so, you know, diversity and inclusion is something that, that any leader has to take into consideration. But when I say has to, I don't mean that from uh, an EEOC standpoint, mm -hmm. I mean that from a, a standpoint of positioning yourself uh, in, in strength or with strength in mind. When you look at the diverse backgrounds of all of your staff, uh, they bring a lot to the organization and the organization 
can benefit from, from those diverse backgrounds. So leadership has to steer that in the right direction, uh, primarily for the good of the organization, but also for the good of everybody in the organization. Yeah, and I think part of that, isn't it, is finding uh, the strengths in people. Because I think so so often, uh, you know, people focus on, oh, well, yeah, he's good at that, but he's not very good at these things. So we've got to fix all those things instead of saying, like, let's focus on what they're good at. And and I think in, in the military, like, you really do have people who are really good at particular things and you bring them together as a team. So um, does some of that translate in the fact that you really do start to look for what are people's strengths? What do they, what do they bring that's unique that you can, you know, mold into a team where you can get the best of everybody instead of trying to focus on the things that, uh, you know, people don't do well? Yes. Uh, so without a doubt, a leader, one of the first things a leader should do is identify the strengths of everybody on their team and make sure that you put that strength first and foremost in their, in their uh, daily activities. Um, that's just, that's, that's not rocket science. That's mm -hmm. not rocket science. That's simply uh, really putting your best foot forward to achieve the objective of the, of the organization. Uh, if I have somebody who's very good at math, uh, I'm not going to assign them to something that's more cultural in nature. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I have somebody who uh, is very thoughtful and very caring, then whatever cultural aspect of the organization needs attention is where I'm going to focus them. It's really, it's it's really uh, taking advantage of people's strengths and and utilizing them to the best of the organization for the best of the organization. And I will say this, that individual will feel tremendous reward. They will feel mm -hmm. empowerment. They will really feel like they're making a meaningful contribution if you take their expertise, so to speak, and, and uh, elevate it for the good of the organization. Yeah, and I, and I totally agree. And it, it's just interesting because a lot of people are probably doing performance reviews around this time of the year. And it seems that... Uh, unfortunately, in a lot of organizations, like the performance reviews, it'll be like, yes, Robert, you've done this well, but let me go through these other areas of development that I have for you that you need to work on, which is very, which is demotivating, but it's also kind of self-defeating because at the end of the day, um, you're so much better seeing how can I maximize Robert's strengths here and, and minimize these instead of trying to make you good at something that you're never going to be good at, probably is I'm much better off putting you where you can make them the most impact. So I would just say that as a, as a share, just a, a tip for people doing performance reviews is uh, if you've come up with a list of things that people don't do well at, well, maybe you shouldn't have them do those. Maybe you should focus <laughs> on the other things. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a great point. I will also say with performance reviews, uh, we can all get better uh, no matter who we are and what we do. And so my methodology, my strategy for, for performance review is, number one, point out those strengths, point out the impact they're having on the organization, and then challenge that person to rise to the next step. Yeah, What's the next exactly. level for you in your personal and professional development? And let's devise a strategy to work together to get you there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're much better off um, having encouraging somebody to go from good to fantastic than you are really bad to somewhat bad or, you know, mediocre to some, you know, to slightly less mediocre, <laughs> the, the yeah. return to the, the organization. So the other thing is, um, obviously, when with the military, as you say, the mission, understanding the mission is key, right? I mean, everybody has to have a clear understanding of, of the mission. Otherwise, it can have obviously catastrophic uh, effects. Um, in, in business, as you build your business, how key is it that everybody in the business understands the mission of the business very clearly so everyone's on the same page in the same way? Yeah, so that's a very relative question, in my opinion, because uh, I'm surprised, uh, even in an organization of my size, 41 people, how many uh, may not have a clear understanding of the mission. Now, you know, making money in ROI certainly is uh, what we have our eye on, but that's not the yeah. only component of the mission. And so, uh, for example, at iFly Virginia Beach, delivering the dream of flight is our mission. And how we do that is our vision. And uh, excellence in all we do is our motto that's associated with that. But it's critical that everybody understands the mission because then they can better contribute to it. They can mm -hmm. better 
uh, improve the quality of product or service if they clearly understand what the objective is. I get good ideas um, all the time, or I, I get suggestions and ideas for product or process improvement uh, on a daily basis. And I welcome that and I love that. Not every idea is a good mm -hmm. idea. Not every idea is an executable idea. Yeah. But there's three things I look at when somebody comes to me with a suggestion. Number one, will it improve the bottom line? Number two, will it enhance the customer experience? And number three, will it enhance the employee experience? Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes to all three of those, we're doing it. If right. the answer is yes to one of those three, we're going to examine the uh, situation more closely. Yeah, and I think that's it. And I think that's an interesting one as well, because sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, in organizations when, you know, companies say, you know, bring your ideas forward, that um, sometimes, you know, they encourage people to bring them forward, but they don't really listen to them. Or in, as you say here, you know, they bring them forward, they examine them and they don't take every idea. And sometimes people don't understand that, yeah, yeah just because your idea wasn't accepted, didn't mean it was a bad idea, but just wasn't the right fit at the, at the right time. And I guess that's part of the culture you build within your organization. So how much, how much are you deliberate about the, the culture you build in your organization? Because a lot of organizations, uh, it happens by uh, just organically or by default, or it just takes its cue from the leader. You know, yeah. I mean, how conscious are you about building a particular type of culture within your organization? Sure. So, um, so for the first three years of our operation, I put out a strategic vision. Every year mm -hmm. in December, I launched the strategic vision for the following year, um, and promoting a positive culture was one of our focus areas for the first three years. Uh, promoting uh, a culture of fitness, promoting a positive culture within. Uh, for the last two years, culture is its own section unto itself mm -hmm. within our strategic plan. So culture went from being a line item to being uh, seven or eight bullets unto its own. And so culture is, is, is formed or enabled from the top down. So I will create an environment where mm -hmm. culture can flourish, a positive culture, but it's realized from the bottom up. At the end of the mm -hmm. day, the team experiences a positive cultural experience, a positive culture in, the, culture in the workplace, or they don't. If they don't, I've got to do something about that. It is, again, when you look at retention of of employees, uh, that positive culture is very important to them. Um, you know, by way of importance, um, the fifth uh, the fifth measure of why I like my job in in recent uh, surveys, not only in the U.S. but in Canada, France, Great Britain, etc. Uh, the fifth reason was pay. The first reason was making a meaningful contribution to the team, and the second reason was do I have uh, good leadership. Do I have leadership that cares about my well-being? So mm -hmm. culture, huge. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. And and I think it's again, it's one thing that uh, companies need to look at because a lot of it is just it just grows organically. And if it grows organically, who knows what kind of culture you're going to end up with? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be deliberate uh, deliberate about it. And I think the other thing that uh, that you touched upon there that I think is is really interesting is is the idea. Of, of retention because one of the challenges I think that organizations face now is that, I mean, especially now with younger people coming into the workforce is millennials tend to, the statistics say, two years at a job, right? Because That's they right. want, you know, they want to move on. So you obviously have to have a culture and an organization where you can onboard people, get them into the business, get them working, get them productive quickly. Hopefully they'll like it and they stay. But if not, at least you get two good years of contribution out of them, right? That's right. That's right. I, I have to say that my objective as a leader and my definition of leadership is to take my education, my training, and most importantly, my experience and help those under my charge get to where it is they're trying to go. Mm -hmm. Help them accomplish what it is they're trying to accomplish. Now, a lot of that is internal to the organization in the, in the workplace, but it, it, it's not all internal. If their objective is to move on to a larger organization and seek higher uh, responsibility and greater pay, I want to help them get there. 
Mm -hmm. And so that's and, and that's a good uh, and and that then doesn't really have a time frame, right? Um, so that could be a short term thing. It could be a long term thing. That's absolutely right. I invest in all my employees as if they're going to be uh, with the company in perpetuity. Uh, but you know, in reality, <laughs> that's not the case. I understand that. But um, these these uh, young people who move on and do good things uh, with their futures, uh, hopefully our paths uh, would cross again one day and we can find mutual benefit down the road. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you have for other leaders? Because um, I know you do leadership coaching and that and help organizations. So what are a couple of things that you would advise um, leaders and organizations maybe to look at this year that they may not have looked at as closely in the past? Sure, there's two things that I'll be very specific about. One is the skills of a leader are perishable. If mm -hmm. a leader doesn't practice his leadership capabilities on a daily basis, they will dwindle or they'll never be established to begin with. And so just like a musician practices for the concert, just like an athlete practices for the game, a leader has to practice on a reoccurring basis to maintain and advance their leadership skills. And when I say reoccurring, I mean daily. Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to read volume after volume uh, on leadership on a daily basis. It means you need to carve out five to 10 to 15 minutes to hone your leadership skills on a daily basis. And there's many, many different ways to do that. Uh, and I can help people, by the way, through Elevate Your Leadership, um, um, an offering that I have. I can help leaders uh, focus and advance their leadership. So number one, Study and advance your leadership on a daily basis. Don't let it perish. Number two, what I have discovered um, as I, as I am in, well into my second career, so to speak, is that the most important things a leader can pay attention to are the following. Rest, hydration, nutrition, exercise, brain and heart health, and lifelong learning. Those six things are so interconnected that a change in any one of those six will have a corresponding change in one or all of the others. For example, if you are not well rested and you're not well hydrated, you might not be in a good uh, position to make good decisions. Mm. And you have to recognize that. Uh, so, so rest, hydration, nutrition, exercise, brain and heart health, and lifelong learning. And again, in my leadership offering, I dive deep into uh, uh, all six of those components of of what I call optimizing your leadership for the rest of your life. Now, those are fantastic tips. So there you go. If you haven't slept very well last night, you've skipped breakfast, you haven't had anything to drink, probably not a good time to make a decision. <laughs> That's right. That's absolutely right. Certainly not an important one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or maybe your decision should be to go back to bed and get some proper <laughs> rest before you make your decision. But uh, listen, this is fantastic, Robert. This has been uh, fascinating. So before we go, if you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself and uh, your organization, how they can contact you. Yeah, absolutely. So the summary is I've taken my 26 years in the military, my 10 years in the private sector, uh, and I've created a leadership offering that is unconventional and it's unlike anything you've experienced. Um, the kind of uh, certified organizations that are out there are good. I've been to them all, but my offering is very unconventional and very different. It's high energy. It's very modern, and it not only looks at today, but it looks at the future. Visit robertpazzini.com to learn more about Elevate Your Leadership with yours truly, Bob Pazzini. Absolutely. That's fantastic, Bob. And all of this will be in uh, Bob's uh, profile on, on Sales Pop. So again, listen, thank you for talking with us today. Uh, hopefully you'll come back and chat with us again soon and we'll uh, dig a little deeper into some of your other ideas. Uh, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you, John.